Wow. Um, thank you all for watching this. Thank you all as well, OV, for watching uh, this beautiful film with us. Um, I want to formally introduce all of the people up here, although I believe Tony and Clela were very formally introduced in the film. Um, but let me tell you a little bit more about Thomas. Um, Thomas is the director of the film, as I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Um, Thomas has worked on documentaries and in public television since 1994. Um, he's also on the board of the International Documentary Association and has been teaching, editing, documentary filmmaking, and mentoring the Sloan Science Films at USC School of Cinematic Arts since 2004. Um, next, please, let's just welcome Tony, who needs no introduction. Um, please also welcome Clela Rorex. Uh, similarly, you need no introduction. Um, and lastly, um, I'd like to e welcome Evan Wolfson. Uh, Evan, I have, I have a fold-out for you <laughs> because you have done so many things, and I want to let you all know about those things. Um, as I mentioned, Evan is the founder and president of Freedom to Marry. Um, in yes, go ahead. You can clap, clap, clap. All the... Mm -hmm. All the OV people are hitting their yeah. applause buttons as well. No crying. No crying. Yeah, no, <laughs> they may still be hitting the crying buttons. Um, in 1983, Evan wrote his Harvard Law School thesis on gay people and the freedom to marry. During the 1990s, he served as on the council in the historic Hawaii marriage case that launched the ongoing global movement for the freedom to marry and has participated in numerous gay rights and HIV AIDS cases. He also wrote the book, Why Marriage Matters, America, Equality, and Gay People's Right to Marry. The National Law Journal in 2000 named Evan one of the 100 most influential lawyers in America. Newsweek dubbed Evan the godfather of gay marriage, and Time Magazine named him one of the, most, one of one, the 100 most influential people in the world. Um, that's quite a little list of things <laughs> there. Um, before we move on to the questions, I just want to say that um, that day that DOMO was overturned, I was also in California. I was on my way up to San Francisco Pride, and um, my fiancé at the time was with me. Jenny's now my wife and is in the audience. And um, to watch a film like this and to sit in this room with so many of you who made that possible for us and for so many others is indescribable. Um, and I know that many of you here with me are um, in the generation of people who may take it for granted, and maybe some of you OV um, watchers at home. And I just want to take a minute to say how important it is that we always remember the people who made these decisions um, and who worked so hard for us to have the rights that we have now today. So thank you so much for everything that you've done for all of us. Okay, now I'm going to ask questions and everyone can stop hitting the crying button. Well, actually, I don't know how you're going to answer them, so we'll see. Um, Tom, I'm going to start with you. Um, my question is, uh, one of the most beautiful things about this film is that it captures such a breadth of uh, the relationship between Tony and Richard. So I want to know, and I'm sure everyone else wants to know as well, how long you worked on this film and why, why this film, why this particular story? I, I've been working on this film for over 14 years. I started working on it in 2001, and um, there was a couple of reasons I wanted to work on it. One of the reasons um, is because as a gay man, I was totally in the closet for 25 years. I was a pediatrician in Ohio, afraid to be out um, to, for who I was, and I was searching for like role models and, and things like that. And the second reason is that in moving to California, I noticed that several of my friends that were gay and lesbian were in relationships with people from another country. And just like in Richard and Tony's story, in the 1990s, they had the same problem. The American couldn't go to the foreign co partner's country, and the foreign partner couldn't come here. So I thought it'd be a great story for a documentary. And in doing my research, I discovered Richard and Tony's story, and Cleela's story, actually. And so, um, and talking to some friends, they happened to live in Los Angeles, and so that was really fortuitous for me. And I started following their story back then. Wonderful. We're all very thankful that you did. 
Um, Tony, my next question is for you, and it is sort of tied together. Um, since for, you said 14 years, Tom, you've been um, following them. For those 14 years, and even for many of the years before that, before you knew there would be a, a documentary, how was it to have so many cameras, so many people watching your story so closely? Um, looking back on it all, um, all that was going around us, whether it's court cases, cameras, or anything else, somehow or another was just a backdrop to our lives. Um, uh, we, uh, we were just very much into each other and, uh, and all we really wanted, I mean, yes, we did want to change the world, but really our main prime goal uh, was to be with each other. And uh, um, that's, that's really what it was like. I'd like just to diverge for a second. I just got very emotional at this screening and I, d I don't get um, emotional at it, but this is probably one of the last times that uh, I'll be it, with an audience going on the screening. But this actually is something to do with you, Evan. Uh, I was wondering why I, um, I came, actually I came apart and I was wondering why. And I realized that for the first time ever seeing the film, someone who really knew and understood what the issue was about was sitting next to me. And so for the first time at a screening, I had someone that I knew knew what we were going through. And that's why I broke up. <laughs> Now I'm breaking up. <laughs> <laughs> we need it. We need our own little yeah. bu buttons. <laughs> um, Clela, I want to ask you. I think uh, a question that you probably get often, um, which is the role that you play in the story as someone who doesn't identify as LGBT yourself. And so, I want to know what compelled you in that moment uh, to issue those marriage licenses. Well, as I s said in the film, I was a feminist. Uh, kind of a budding feminist, but to me it was simply an issue of fairness and non-discrimination, and it just, it was as simple as that, really. Was I going to be the one to say no? No, I didn't, and I'm very glad that I didn't because it would be so hard now to look myself in the mirror if I'd had that moment in life and hadn't taken it. Yeah, I think you stand as a very strong example of how powerful our allies are. Um, that, you know, I think many of us talk about this frequently, that we can't do this without our allies. And, and this is actually, you know, pen to paper action that you took. Um, so thank you for that. It's pen to paper. Yep. <laughs> yes, literally. literally. Yeah. <laughs> um, Evan, um, Freedom to Marry is the leading organization focusing on marriage equality nationally. Um, what do you think a film like this does for that movement? One of the chief engines of change has been people telling their stories, people being willing to share, let other people into their lives, risk disappointment and rejection in order to help other people rise. And this film, Tom's film, is just such an extraordinarily effective example of that. And it centers on, of course, the decency and strength and really purity of commitment that Clela showed and above all, the, the love story that Tony and Richard had, which was not an artificial story, and everybody can see it meticulously, beautifully, richly portrayed year after year after year, thanks to Tony's letting Tom into their lives at such you know, painful moments, clearly. And I also want to call out one other thing, which is that Throughout the storytelling, not only do we see their love, but Tony's unfailing optimism and unfailing confidence that other people can do better is what we have all, as a movement, needed to bring to this, that we could believe that we could see a change, that other people could do better and could change. And Tony expressed that you know, year after year after year in encounter after encounter, despite everything they were going through. And it's, it's just a remarkable example for all of us to share. And that's why I think this film will so powerfully resonate, because it connects not only the love and the personal with what we need as people seeking a change. Absolutely. 
and making that so visible. I think that our visibility and as our visibility increases is why we keep seeing these laws being overturned and you know that you yeah. were there in the beginning when so few people were visible to be visible. You know, you knocked the first domino. Um, so yes. And actually I want to add one other thing that really I found so powerful about Tom's film which is that it shows not only how this discrimination and injustice affected Richard and Tony but how it affected their family. Mm -hmm. I mean look look at what it did to this family and this family that Tony came to be part of and acquired and enriched and look what they had to suffer mm -hmm. for all these years because of the discrimination directed against gay couples like Richard and Tony. Absolutely. Yep. It's a very good point. It's very good. Um, Tom, I'm going to come back to you. Um, I want to talk, obviously we're talking about uh, the core of the film, which is the relationship, the love, and, and the law, but there's so much um, incredible footage um, of LGBT history in the film, and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that, um, how you came to find all of it and use all of it in the film. I, I wanted to tell a love story first and foremost because I believe that um, that's the way to create change, to show uh, someone's love over many periods of time facing unbelievable odds and obstacles and yet staying together. But to me, one of the things that I've seen in teaching and just in talking to a lot of young LGBT people and also the straight community is that we don't know our own history. And so it was really important for me through the love story to, as you watch Richard and Tony fighting through the decades, that you could understand how American society was changing over those decades, and that's why we found the archival footage. But it took like 10 years to find all that footage. And we searched everywhere, and even, I mean, it was like the state of our archives are in big trouble, and I was just very fortunate to find it. And even the day of picture lock, which is the day we stopped editing, in my email shows up um, footage from ABC News archives that we had asked for like four years earlier, and that was the footage of of Tony and Richard at the airport the night they, they had to leave, and Tony and Richard the night before, where people were going through their house and taking their possessions and some court cases. So there was a lot of fortuitous and unbelievable ir ironies and coincidences coincidences in making this film and that was just one of them. Yeah, there's something so powerful um, from from my vantage point too of seeing that history continue into the time that um, that I was a part of it and I think that a lot of people in the audience will feel that too that it wasn't just that you were seeing something from the past that it was that you were seeing the entire progression of it and realizing kind of your place in, in all of it. Um, Tony, I, I would love to know um, what is going on in your life now. And you know, we left with these footnotes um, about your your legal status. Are you still? Um... Well, I'm still undocumented. But um, uh, after Richard died, I wrote to President Obama um, requesting an apology if it could be done for the faggot letter because I didn't feel Richard, as a person who loved his country and believed in its goals and aspirations and ideals, uh, deserved to have that as a living piece of the file. Well, on the first day in office, the new head of immigration, in response to my letter to President Obama, wrote a letter and they apologized to both of us for the faggot letter. And also they referred um, my issue back to the Board of Immigration Appeals from 1975. And concurrently, at the same time, uh, we have a wid uh, petition, as it mentions in the film, widower's petition uh, to get me my uh, uh, green card as the spouse of uh, a U.S. citizen. Both issues require the acknowledgement of the 1975 marriage. And also, uh, uh, 12 months ago, or actually last December, uh, I finally, after working 40 years, got my work permit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Clela, to you. I, I hope that this that you continue to see each other. Do you? Do you? Do the two of you see each other? Um, this isn't my official question. I'm just getting curious now. Uh, do, do the two of you get to see each other um, often, or is it just for for screenings like this that you come together? And, and... it's uh, largely been for screenings. Although um, I was able to see Richard after his diagnosis of cancer that Thanksgiving, and 
I am so very glad that I was able to do that. But I've been sitting here tonight just emotional about it, wondering when we will see each other again. Mm -hmm. Hopefully we will. I know screenings are coming to an end and PBS showing on the 15th is kind of the end of the project finally. And um, finally. I just don't want it to <laughs> <laughs> Well, we need to come to Evan's reception in the 9th of July, was it? 9th of July. July. We're hoping for a celebration, fingers crossed, yes. and of course, we want you there. There you go. See, we, there's yeah, already we a plan. And, you know, <laughs> we'll just have to make a point of staying in contact with each other. We will say, always do that. Yeah. We'll always do yeah. that. Um, Evan, as we're talking about right now, there's a big decision coming up um, on cases, and um, I want to know what you think this decision will do to the country um, in both directions, if, um, if it goes the way that we all, I think, in this room want it to go, or if it doesn't. Um, how do you think that will affect the country? Right. Well, the marriage decision is now in the hands of the Supreme Court, and this this overnight momentum that's been 40 plus years in the making is now before the justices and I feel very hopeful because I believe that we as a movement of gay and non-gay people working together have made the case not only to the court and we've seen 65 plus court rulings in our favor in the last two years but we've made that case to the country and no matter what the court decides as Tony said in, a, in an even darker moment in the film, we will keep fighting, we will keep making the case, we will keep storing, and the American people will keep growing in support, and the system, the courts, will get it right eventually. But I hope that eventually is within the next few weeks, <laughs> mm -hmm. and I'm very, very hopeful that the court will rule in our favor and end this discrimination nationwide. And what that will mean, as your question very perfectly said, it is not only a victory for couples like Richard and Tony and people like you and me and us and our loved ones, but it will be a win for the country because it will be an affirmation of what America stands for. And it will show that America, with all its challenges and flaws and sometimes getting things wrong, is a country where we, if we do the work, we can get it right and people open their hearts and change. And that is the beautiful story here. And I hope it has the the ending that we're looking for that we can celebrate hopefully in a matter of weeks. Absolutely. And, and because we live in the country like we do, one of the reasons I made this film is to show that, you know, Richard and Tony and Clela were not celebrities. They, they were everyday citizens who, who believed in a cause or believed in what was right and they just fought for it. And I, I hear all the time, oh, I'm just one person, I can't do anything. But actually, you can do something. You can stand up for your rights and you can change laws. And in this case, maybe it's 40 years, but sometimes it's a lot quicker. I can make movies, you can create freedom to marry and fight for that. We can do something. And I just don't want people to lose sight of, like, we can do something to change, change I want to America. I uh, yeah. add something to that, and, uh, and I'm adding it as a person who is not an American citizen, um, because you hear from us foreign nationals a lot of criticism of the country, and, and I've had my voice in the chorus of criticism over the years, but as I've been saying to people of late, if Richard and I had tried to do what we did in this country, in any other country, we wouldn't have got the first base. I know exactly what they would have done in Australia. They would have rolled around on the floor laughing, pointing their finger at us and ridiculing it and laughed it out of existence. And as much as at times, which is quite natural as a gay and lesbian person, I've had my moments of uh, being cranky with the country, um, we got a hearing. We got a hearing in this country and I don't believe we would have got it in any other country. So I just want to add that to the other two statements. Yeah, and, and you have kind of answered one of my last questions, which was to all of you, uh, which was just as trailblazers, as people who have made this change, what would you tell um, all of us to continue doing? And I feel like you, you yes. hit that right on the head. Um, would either of you like to add, would any of you like to add anything to that, to, to the audience? I speak to schools. For the last two years, I've gone into schools with a panel of representative um, L members of the LGBT community, and I represent as an ally and try very hard to talk to students about the importance of 
not being a bystander, most particularly with social justice issues. And uh, what does that mean? It means speaking up. It means getting to the polls. It means voting. It means writing your congressperson. It means, you know, just basic things that anybody can do. But speaking out at any level, any moment that you get is important. I, I completely agree with that. And I would add to that that it's never over. You have to always keep yes. speaking out because there's always somebody else who needs to hear it and there's always somebody who needs to hear it more than once. And, you know, the footage in, in Tom's film of the, the marches and the parades and the organizing and the speaking that these guys were doing in the 70s and in the 80s on the Freedom to Marry, well, it turned out that wasn't quite enough and we had to do it again and we had to do it yep. again and we had to do it again. So there's always an opportunity for everyone to contribute and make their part and make a difference and no one person, no one voice reaches everyone. There's always somebody you can reach that somebody else might not reach. And once we've won the Freedom to Marry, we hope, in a matter of weeks, there will be plenty more left to do. We will not be done. We will have won the freedom to marry. This campaign will be over. And there's plenty of other civil rights and human rights work to do. And as a matter of fact, on the issue of marriage, I mean, we're, as a, a member of the LGBT community, we've got to still work on uh, employment discrimination, etc. But also on the issue of marriage, um, we have achieved freedom of mar to marry. But there are a whole lot of people in this country who still cannot get married or choose not to get married who are in relationships. And so all we've done was move the goalposts, but those people too are to be considered. Absolutely. I think there's some online questions. Yes, there are. Um, so o OV years, where are you? There you are. I have to look for the red light. That's where the OV people are. Hello. Um, so we have a comment, not a question, from Jannie. Thank you for teaching us about a part of our history that I'm sure many young LGBT people like me aren't aware of. Oh, that's amazing. That's exactly what I was hoping was happening. You did a good job. <laughs> um, for Evan, have you encountered many other stories similar to Tony's and Richard's from Juliana Wilson? Well, this is a powerful and long and beautiful story, and Tom has told it thanks to Tony and Richard opening their lives for so many years so exquisitely well. But of course, yes, everybody has a story, and there are, there are millions of these stories because it's, again, it's not only the gay couple, it's our, our loved ones, our, our parents, our, our, our siblings, our, our friends, our, and so on. So yes, everybody has a story, and there are so many of these stories. On the night before the Supreme Court argument, Freedom to Marry was thinking about how do we mark this moment, these 40 plus years, and we decided to invite, first we decided to compile the list of every marriage plaintiff throughout history, and no one had ever done that before. And uh, certainly Tony and Richard were among the first, but as they would be the first to say, they weren't even the first. And so we went back and pulled this together, and my great team worked it through, and we had this, and then we invited as many of them as we could reach to to come to Washington, to be there with us on the eve of the Supreme Court argument, and to celebrate. And Tony was there, and uh, so were 80 plus other couples. And each of them had a story, and they had their kids, and they had their lawyers, and they had the supporters, <laughs> and so on. So yes, there are so many wonderful stories. And you know what? As Cleola said, we each have a voice, and we each have a story, and we need to share it. Absolutely. Um, from Meg, and this is for everyone. History stories like these are often omitted from mainstream culture and the education system. How do you propose we tell these stories and spread the legacy of wonderful pioneers like Tony to future generations? Well, I think by just um, thank our lucky stars that we have ITVS and PBS to help us fund, <laughs> fund some of these stories because it, it, it takes a lot to, to put them out and to give us a platform to do that and film festivals. And what's great is I teach my students, we now have social media. And I think that's the key right now is you can use Twitter, you can use YouTube, you can use all these different platforms. You can tell very personal stories and you can build an audience and you can get your message out. I think that's where we're headed. My answer is fairly short. Uh, I believe in a democracy that people should be talking to each other. Just keep talking to each other, sharing their experiences and sharing their beliefs and their feelings. And for instance, people know our story uh, 
tell people about it and not I mean not our names that doesn't matter but tell them the story and tell them this what Evan was saying about you know it's it is in the hundreds of thousands or millions you know uh, these stories and uh, uh, so I think the most important thing in a free society is to talk and talk and talk to each other I do a lot of talking <laughs> <laughs> yes, Me too. Yes, he does. <laughs> And I do a lot of Facebooking, issuing my opinions all the time <laughs> <laughs> on history, not just for LGBT uh, rights, but of course, feminist rights that I've lived long enough to see how they continue to be eroded when we thought we'd won already many of those rights. And um, I was interviewed, my story was told um, through StoryCorp and is now indoctrinated in the um, National Archives. So I'm hoping over the years, as, as with, I mean, they interviewed a lot of people for their, um, their specific um, focus for LGBT stories. And it, it's important, you know, that over the years, people will have these stories that they can hear and trying to let younger people know that these stories are there so that they don't forget the history. Mm -hmm. It's very important. Well, I, and I would, I'll try to be as short as Tony. The, the, uh, it's not just stories as in history. These are stories that are live and are being lived now and that hearts, heart, hearts and minds respond to now. And you know, we will have won the freedom to marry, we hope, mm -hmm. in the Supreme Court in a few weeks. And the marriage conversation will then come to so many families and to so many parts of the country, and the stories will begin anew. Plenty of stories ahead, plenty of work to do. Yes. Absolutely. Um, I want to add just one thing to Meg and anyone else who has this question. I, I feel like there's two really important parts, and you touched on it with social media being one of them. You know, this you can find the link to this film, the trailer to this film, share it. Um, pull quotes from it and put them on Tumblr. Oh, right, that, I, I did a whole monologue about how the red light was where I was supposed to look and I, <laughs> they saw the side of my face. Um, but yeah, find little things. You, you all know what gets spread on social media. Find things, and not just from, from this film, but from um, other archival places. And that's my second point that I just want to touch on is look into the archival places in your area. Um, I know that here, that in New York, there's a Lesbian Her Story archives. There's a beautiful archive. Yeah, and there are so many places like that that so many of us don't even know exist. So look up those places and support them because uh, not a lot of people do. And this is exactly why they're important. And freedomtomarry.org, we have lots of materials, lots of stories, lots of ways that people can take tools to make their voice heard as well. And, and the One National Archives is in Los Angeles. And one of the great resources that people don't think of is your libraries in all the, all the cities. Your libraries have a great great, great um, resource. Yeah. Um, do we have any questions from the audience? Yes. So aren't you, shouldn't you be getting Social Security? I mean, couldn't you petition to get um, Richard Social Security once, well, if everything goes through? Well, if it goes through, then that becomes, you know, something to be discussed, you know, and worked out. But uh, you brought up an important question. Which Sorry, goes... Tony, I'm just going to repeat the question for the oh. OV audience. The okay. question is, shouldn't you be able to get Social Security? Why can't you get Social Security? And where I'd got to in the audience, and this is, you know, all the communities are interconnected. The feminist movement, the, um, our, our community, uh, the undocumented community, we're all connected. And uh, as a, a person who's been undocumented, uh, the plight of undocumented people in this country and contrary to popular belief, most of them are paying taxes, is they contribute to Social Security, but we never get to collect it. The government gets to keep the money, and in fact, in new immigration proposals, the, the Republicans are saying they want to confiscate all our Social Security contributions. But hopefully, uh, I will get uh, the choice of Richard's or mine, or the, a combination of however they work it out, um, once I get documented. Do we have other questions from the audience? No, it's harder to ask in person. <laughs> I have a question. Were Cleo, were you, have you been following their story through the years? Like, how did you guys reconnect initially? Um, the question, OVers, can I call you that? Is um, how did you reconnect over the yeah. years after that initial fateful day in 1975? After um, I issued those licenses, there were occasional news pieces that I saw 
about Tony and Richard. Certainly the faggot letter was one of them. I knew about that. But I didn't get to meet Tony and Richard personally until Tom contacted me about helping um, tell my side, part of the story, that little piece, with, uh, for the film. And I am so glad that that happened. Um, first of all, with the whole film project, I met so many wonderful people in this journey. But getting to meet Tony and Richard personally, to see what a marriage license, a little piece of paper meant to them, it brought it full circle for me. It, it kind of closed, the, closed that part of it for me. And I'm just very glad it ended up that way. Yes. First of all, thank you for the beautiful film. Um, so the immigration piece is such a compelling aspect of the film. Um, and specifically, the, your comment when you were sneaking back across the border about oh, yeah. on the on the border agent's racism. Um, I'm, I'm, it's interesting to me that you're a you know, light-skinned person um, in hiding over those years. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk about that ex those years. Um, uh, and you mentioned having worked for m many years. What was it like to be sort of in hiding, undocumented, attempting to work um, as a white skinned person in America? I'm the, sorry. The question um, was for Tony, and it was basically what was it like to be in hiding in this country for so many years to try to find work um, and just to live without the ability to leave? Well, the important part of his question actually was as a white person, uh, I was very aware the whole time. Uh, the color of my skin worked to my advantage. If I had been Latino, or had it been Richard, uh, the Filipino had been the foreign national, it would have been a totally different story. Um, Americans make, uh, not all Americans obviously, but uh, in generalizations are always got error, but Americans tend to think that if you're white, you're the American, or you have the right to be here. So I, I mean, I never had to worry if the police stopped me, I mean, consciously have to worry if the police stopped me if I was driving uh, say an, in the wrong lane, that I would run into the same account, uh, encounter what a Latino uh, encounters. Um, I, I'm very aware of that, and uh, and I think your question's important because I, it gives me an opportunity to uh, say what I, I think that Latinos would want me to say is that my journey was not as fraught with danger, uh, turmoil, and nervousness and insecurity as their journey is. Uh, I have it much better than the Latino undocumented foreign national. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I, for one second, don't think that what I just said is false. And I'm very glad you asked the question. Uh, yes. Hi. Hi. Beautiful, important uh, story. And um, something that struck me was when you got married in 1975, you brought your ministers with you. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering uh, what what church, was that an Episcopal church or, you know, that's such an ironic thing. Okay, well. And, and a, a really beautiful example of your church accepting you, you know, that it, that it can be, um, that is possible. Um, yeah, so um, the red light just bounces all over the place. <laughs> oh, it's there, but okay. Um, so the question was, you, we saw the footage where um, in 1975 you had ministers present um, at your ceremony. And please correct me if I'm mis misphrasing this, but I think your question was, um, how was that, A, to be in that environment, um, and, and also B, um, how did it come to be that you could be in an accepting environment? Is that? Well, it seemed like you were part of a church that, uh, I, that accepted you. Uh, um, Evan, a little while ago, mentioned the fact that, you know, there are many people that make up a history. Mm -hmm. a very imp uh, there are two significant uh, people before Richard and I. Uh, one was a couple, uh, Baker, and oh God, I can't remember. Yeah, O'Connell, uh, in Minnesota, who tried to get a, a marriage license and went to court and uh, got refused. 
Uh, then there was uh, Reverend Troy Perry, who founded the Metropolitan Community Churches. And Troy uh, started to perform in the churches gay marriages or gay and lesbian marriages, um, which he called holy unions, uh, because the, the more excitable branch of Christianity got hysterical to use the word marriage. Um, he was a very important, because they introduced to our mind the concept that we can go this route. So when Richard and I decided what to do, I had met Troy uh, on an earlier visit to the United States. I had actually made a point to meet him. Um, Richard and I went and met with Troy and asked for his help. Um, and so uh, we got a holy union in his church because we were going to go another route on basing, hoping we could use freedom of religion. And um, so when the um, Boulder marriages came available, um, there was one person I had met through Troy, Frank Zarelli, who was a witness at the, the ceremony. And uh, so we uh, decided to stick with the crowd that we'd started the journey on. And we took uh, uh, one minister with us and another one from the church happened to be, or two of them happened to be in Colorado at the time. I'm not a, a practicing Christian. I, I'm not, I, uh, my, I'm more into whatever spirituality is. Uh, so I don't want to in, appear to be endorsing a church, but I certainly endorse the actions of Troy and the Metropolitan Community Churches. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes. Okay. All right, here I go. <laughs> Pending um, that things go the way we want them to go, um, will you change the end of the film was the question to Tom. Um, and to Tony, the question was, if you get a green card, um, where will you go first? Did I miss a piece of it? Was there another? And who would take the story to Australia. And will you take the story to Australia? So for me, one of the reasons I edited it the way I did was to put, to put cards at the end so that because history keeps on changing and I've been doing this film way too long. <laughs> and so, so that I was hoping, you know, I'm very hopeful that it will change. And so that, that way, yes, it will be updated and hopefully it will say the Supreme Court, you know, has recognized same-sex marriage in all states. And then, and the other part of it is that hopefully at some point it will change Tony's status and we can update the film that way too. And answering my part of your question, when Richard first died, um, I was thinking about where I would go to live, etc. And he and I were extraordinarily happy in Paris. And uh, I thought of Paris. I thought of Ireland, which was refuge for us when we were in exile. I obviously thought of Australia. Um, this last year with the film, I've been traveling around this country. And I live in Los Angeles, and you get a rather warped view of America in <laughs> Los Angeles. And I have discovered, uh, and I've been down places like um, uh, Savannah, Orlando. I've been uh, at Salem in Massachusetts. I've been lots of different little parts of the country. And I've discovered the country is the most extraordinarily interesting country. I've also discovered that our stereotypes of other parts of the country are just as bad as the stereotypes used to be about our community. And uh, I think that possibly uh, my first thing is I want to travel around this country. I discovered that uh, I really am loving the place now that a lot of the pressure is off. And I think I just want to go and get to know America better uh, and spend some time doing that. And I'll just say I completely get that. And of course, it's all about freedom and choice. But as you know, this struggle for the freedom to marry is not only happening in the United right. States. And yes. you mentioned Ireland. And we want to give a shout out to Ireland, yep. that, where the people opened their hearts and heard these mm -hmm. kinds of stories, local and personal, and embraced the freedom to marry by a resounding vote. And one of the battlegrounds where we're fighting for the freedom to marry, and I think we're actually in a teeny bit of a race, though, if the Supreme Court does its job, the United States will get there first, is Australia. Yeah, Australia yes. Whereas, you know, you know, New Zealand has done it, yeah. and we're looking to Australia to be one of the next uh, countries to end this discrimination, right. and so they need to hear from you as well. Oh, yes, well, they have been hearing from me. <laughs> and, the, and the film has been shown That's down there. The film's been showing all across the world, actually, yeah. and um, it will actually be on uh, a channel in Australia in July. Oh. And, and I want to add a bit to what Evan said about Ireland. 
uh, I'm descended from, uh, which I didn't know till later on in life, from a, a real Irish revolutionary. He was going to be hung, drawn and quartered, but they decided that what was worse than that was that they shipped him to Australia. <laughs> so Ireland has a very special place and very special place in my heart. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Uh, yes, back here first. Um, I'd love to know um, sort of the role of family. Um, Richard's, Richard's family seems really accepting from the beginning. It's really, really powerful. Um, so can you talk about the role of his family? Your kids seem to be more of a painful journey. Um, but the role of family in your uh, partnership. Uh, the question to the question. Tony, oh, I, I'll repeat it for you too. The question for Tony was um, the role of family. Um, obviously, your connection to Richard's family seemed mm. incredibly strong, um, mm. and we heard about your relationship to your own family in Australia. Um, and so it was more of a general question of, of your thoughts on the role of family in your process. And yeah, Richard's family. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I was well, referring uh, to them as your family too. Uh, yeah. My um, uh, blood family in Australia. Uh, an aunt of mine in Australia, the family had been told I was dead decades ago, uh, but I had an aunt, and it was my favourite aunt, who refused to believe it, and she had told her children that um, they must find me. When Richard's uh, obituary was published, one of my cousins who was living in Berkeley, California, read it and got in contact with our lawyer. So my, I, I have, uh, I, and I have a half-brother who I hadn't seen since he's 12, and he's now 50, in his middle 50s. So I've got something going there. But it's nowhere as close as um, my relationship with Richard's family. They've been my family in the most important part of my life. They were supportive, uh, etc. Um, I hope that answers the question. Um, I, I love Richard's family, and uh, it's a terrible thing if any of my family are watching this in Australia. Uh, don't take it the wrong way, but if I have to choose at this point in my life, it's Richard's family that's the one I have bonded with the most. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and I, yes, please. Um, so I'm, I'm a gay man, and I'm a father of two girls who are adopted, and I'm also a documentary film producer, and I'm, the question is for Evan. Um, you alluded to sort of what's next, and I'm wondering if you could, with a crystal ball, what do you see in, in this country as the next wave of LGBT issues that will bubble up in this way I'm thinking you know are they trans issues are they same-sex parent you know adoption issues are they employment discrimination what what do you see in your crystal ball the question was for Evan um, as pertains to his crystal ball um, uh, basically the question is that um, Evan mentioned that there is more to be done even if we are happy with the decision um, this June um, we want to know what what Evan thinks is going to be the next big issue or perhaps the next series of big issues in this fight. Sure. So uh, let me just quickly do a shout out to another character in the film who's my good friend Levy Soloway, the attorney who, had, who labored all these years. And, and he's a perfect example of someone who, like all of us, has been with something, has fought for it, has seen progress, but hasn't stopped. And so to your point, uh, it's not even so much the next thing. Of course, winning the Freedom to Marry is enormously important. It's not done yet, but we're hoping. And if we do win the Freedom to Marry, we're going to harness that conversation to the work ahead, including increasing support and visibility in many parts of the country through this language of marriage, love and commitment. But we do not have a federal civil rights law in this country that prohibits discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. And I believe that needs to be a top priority, big goal for our movement to work for and make the case for. We need to win as many state and local non-discrimination measures as possible, prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender identity. We need to also not think in terms only of the law, but it's how do we actually improve the lived experience of people, of gay people, of transgender people, of women, of people, of Latinos and others, who, so that everyone in every part of the country has the ability not only to have our legal rights, which we need to have and fight for, but just also to be able to wake up and dream big and feel included, feel respected, feel affirmed, not worry about the family, not worry about the churches, not worry about the many other obstacles. And we need to bring those down. And so that's, you know, that's obviously a list that will keep going. 
and we're all going to have to be able to bring our part to it. But we can, again, harness the power of the winds and our belief we can do it to that list of things and make them happen. Well, thank you to all of you so much for being here. Thank you all for being an amazing audience. Thank you all for being an amazing audience. I have a feeling you were. I can't tell, but I think you were. Um, and I just want to give one last shout to um, all of the partners that helped make this event possible. WNET, Independent Lens, ITVS, PBS, CPB, um, Rocky Mountain PBS, NET, and First Person. And then again, the community partners, Freedom to Marry, Immigration Equality, Out for Immigration, GLAAD, and the Asian Pride Project. Um, and please remember, this movie is going to be on independent lens uh, Monday, June 15th at 10 p.m. Eastern time. And to all of you humans on the internet, tell people about it. Let them know that it's um, going to be viewable on their television screens. Put this out there. It's an incredibly important film and an incredibly important story. So thank you all again.